I'm a choir director at the University of Louisiana in Lafayette. And I spend all of my time every week in front of choirs. One of the things that, uh, as you'll see in this picture, I have to dress into a nice tuxedo and have my baton. I have to have uh, my bow tie on. And so there I am with the University of Louisiana at Lafayette Chamber Singers at a beautiful church in New Orleans. But I have a confession to make. Uh, in my spare time, and especially on the weekends, I secretly turn into a metal detector hobbyist and go out into the sugarcane fields here, the muddy, swampy sugarcane fields in South Louisiana in search of relics and items from the past. So I forgo my conductor's baton for another type of wand and my bow tie and tuxedo for shrimp boots and go out and play in the mud. And this is one of the items that I found, a silver coin, which was minted in 1799 in Mexico under Spanish rule. See, Louisiana was not a state in 1799, of course, and we didn't have our mint here in New Orleans until the 1830s. So naturally, the only mint that was in operation, which was in Philadelphia, those coins were so geographically isolated from making their way down here to South Louisiana that the currency of the time was an odd mix of French coins, Spanish coins, some English coins, and even some South American and Mexican coins like the one you see. This coin has a plow strike on it. It was slightly bent when I found it. So at some point during its 200 year sleep under the sugarcane field, it was struck by a plow and slightly bent. It's also hold, and holding coins was a common practice to keep them safe because you could then take a coin and put it on a piece of wire, thin piece of wire, or sew it into a garment for safekeeping because pockets weren't available in clothing until the 1800s. You can also see on the back of this coin that it has a brazing mark. That brazing mark is where something was attached to it, like silver solder, and it indicates that this coin may have spent part of its time actually as a sleeve link or cuff link in a colonial era garment, which is fascinating. When I found this coin, which is only worth five, ten dollars in its current hold, brazed, plow bent, worn condition, it was an incredible moment for me because I was the first person to touch this item in 200 years. And to forge that connection with the past, it just, I was sitting there with my knees in the dirt or mud and my thoughts in the clouds, thinking about the places that this coin had been, the hands that this coin passed through. And I was thinking about how it was lost and why. And so the past and the present became fused together for me in that one very personal uh, and very intimate moment. And so this connection, just imagining all of these, these narratives for this coin. And I was thinking, well, maybe this coin, the owner had a plan for it, uh, a pint of ale or some tobacco to smoke. Perhaps it could have been used to buy cloth or a couple of shoe buckles or maybe even medicine for a sick child. And then I started to think about imagined narratives for how this coin would have been lost. Did it fall through a leather money pouch through a small hole? Did it uh, get dropped unceremoniously by accident on the ground? Did the silver brazing on the back, on the sleeve link, become weakened over time so that some colonial settler mounted or dismounted their horse and the coin fell silently to the earth where I found it 200 years later? Are any of these narratives right? Is there any way to know how this coin came to rest in that particular sugarcane field? There's no way to know. But in not knowing the answer and in never being able to know the answer, that doesn't in any way invalidate that connection that I made with this item where the past and the present became one. What you're seeing before you is a manuscript from the 1500s. This is by English composer John Brown. The piece is called Jesu Mercy, How May This Be? It's a motet. When I first saw this manuscript, I was struck by the beauty of this as just art, the colorations on the page, the large beginning letters for the text, and I was also struck by how functional this is as a means to very imperfectly try to record sound on a printed page. And so I was filled with all of these ideas imaginatively about how this piece could have sounded 300 years ago. And my mind starts to imagine all of these narratives, imagining a narrative for the music that I can then focus and communicate to my ensemble, my choir, and that they can internalize and communicate to my audience. And so the past and the present become fused. And in that one very deep and highly personal moment, 
I feel that I can say this in no other way than how I'm imagining it in my mind. But then I start to look at historical language pronunciation and performance practices from earlier centuries, and I realize that the language of this piece even is different, even though it's in English. Jesu mercy, how may this be that God himself for soul mankind would take on him humanity becomes in early modern English pronunciation. Jesu mercy, how may this be that God himself for soul mankind would take on him humanity. And so even my own native tongue gets kind of turned on its head, and the things which are familiar are at once defamiliarized. It's fascinating. And then my, uh, my choir and I uh, learn this music, and we perform it. And in what you're about to hear, we have a beautiful uh, personal moment in the concert hall when the audience gets to hear something that sounds like this. What you just heard the right answer. Is this the way this music, this particular manuscript, sounded 300 years ago? There's no way to know. There's no way any of us alive today will ever know what any individual performance of this piece sounded like before the advent of recording technology. But that doesn't devalue the connection that I made with this item from the past, the connection that my singers made, and most importantly, the connection with the audience. Because you see, my singers and I are a family, and we endeavor to create something through our long, hard work that's beautiful. And that connection is so much more large than any questions about right or wrong. And my own thought about these two strangely odd pursuits that I'm involved so heavily in, music and metal detecting, I started to see some common threads that began to emerge, and I wanted to put my finger on what was common between these in terms of my creative process and my thought process between the two. And I came to realize that there were three main things that I was doing, and they are very important and integral to my process creatively as a musician. And the first one was that I was standing in awe and wonder of the things that I was experiencing, taking the time to be in awe of those things and undertaking in wonder a journey of pure thought. The second thing that I was doing was removing roadblocks like fear, doubt, or stress, because all of these would hinder my ability to conceptually think of anything. And so I was removing the roadblocks of feeling like I had to make the right choice, that there was one right answer or one solution. And third of all, I was embracing the unknown. The unknown is often something that's so scary, but here in music, and in any art, there's always something that's unknown, always something pushing us to strive to be more. And I'm struck by the words of contemporary poet Mark Strand, who was interviewed by a psychologist about his creative process. And Mark Strand said, the idea is to be saturated with your work, so completely saturated with it that there's no past, that there's no present, that there's no future that these all get rolled into one thing that's just a continuous present, so to speak, in which you're making meaning and destroying meaning and remaking meaning without any undue regard for the words that you're selecting for your poem. And in fact, when you're working really well, you're achieving total communication, not just basic communication or everyday communication, that it's meaning carried to a higher order and that you have the sense, the overwhelming sense, that there's no other way of saying what you're saying. For Mark Strand, this is a person, this poet, who's reveling and standing in awe of his own creative process. He's able to give himself permission to make meanings and destroy meanings freely. 
And what he's doing, in a sense, is bridging the gap. He's bridging the gap between the words that he's writing on the page and the meanings that those words are going to instill. But he might as well have been bridging the gap between a 300-year-old manuscript or a manuscript written last year of music and bridging the gap of countries and continents and centuries and languages and dialects so that those words will have meaning in the audience's hearts. Or, <laughs> down to earth, forgive the pun, a simple relic found in a farm field and the meanings that it could give us if it could talk. You see, in many professions, we're not encouraged to imagine, to stand in wonder, and to ask of easy answers. But in fact, some professions, to ask these unsolvable questions, to post these unsolvable theorems, could seriously damage one's career. You see, for many reasons, the unknown completely scares us. It terrifies us. But it's never as bad as we expect it to be. And in my personal life, and in my music making, which are intertwining all the time, I have to find a way to get past my personal fears in order to be a leader. Somehow I'm called to be a leader, because when I get up on the podium with the baton in my hand, I have to have a single vision that's so strong and powerful that it can carry a choir through a rehearsal. So I have to take these imagined solutions, these imagined narratives, and turn them into a sonic reality. And that imagined answer has to become so strong that it becomes a mantra, that it becomes a conviction, so that I can take this group of people and lead them through this long journey to a beautiful sonic reality at the end. And as a musician, I'm accountable. I'm accountable to myself. I'm accountable to my audience. And I'm also accountable to my choir because I have to lead them through. And it's like imagining a place where you've never been. You don't even know if it exists. You don't know if it even can exist. Imagining it in your mind's ear. And then walking into a room full of strangers and saying, I'm going to convince every one of you that you're going to travel with me there. The journey will be long. This is minding the gap. We see this everywhere. The gap terrifies us. It's something that's unknowable or undefinable. It's some place that we don't want to end up by accident. The gap between a musical score and its modern performance. The gap between all of us as human beings because we're bounded by skin. The gap between words said and words heard. I believe that we're witnessing a difficult and unusual trend in human behavior. And that trend is the relentless and exhaustive documentation of things, the documentation of experiences. It's almost as if we're in such a rush to define things that we never quite live them ourselves. In such a rush to document it, to record it, so that we don't lose it, that perhaps we're not ever there to begin with. The title of this slide is called, Went to Visit Grandma. <laughs> it's almost as if memory itself, because of its fleeting nature, much like music, because it's a chimera, because it's here today and gone tomorrow, because it fades over time, because it's never as fresh afterwards as it was in that moment. We want to hold on to it. We want to record it so that we, when we go back, we can see it and hope to live it as freshly. But maybe we're not as there, as much there um, in doing so. Or maybe when we go back, the things that we remember are not the memory, but the documentation. This is called, If the Titanic Sank Today. <laughs> and so I'm concerned because the world doesn't encourage us to wonder. And part of the reason is because now more than ever, the answers are at our fingertips. Why ask them when they're a search box away? There's so much information now in our world that's right at our fingertips more than ever. And so we're not encouraged to wonder, to think about the potential answers and not care whether they're right or wrong. You see, this moment is, and so are 100,000 other moments. And I'm striving in my personal life every day to see every place, every item is something that I can interact with that I can bridge the gap between, that I can form real, personal, and profound connections with. And more than anything, that there are things in this world, but the ideas behind those things are so much bigger than those things themselves. They're so much more profound. 
And I'm reminded of how when I was younger, I would drive past the farm field many times in my car, and I would just say, there's another field like every other field. But then when I get out of my car and I go speak to the property owners that own this land, I talk with them. I get permission to go on their land and walk. And I get my boots on the ground and I see the shape of every flower, every tree, the cow rutted paths through the pasture, the shape of every rock. I feel like I truly know this land. And even more than knowing it in the present, when I have a metal detector on my arm, I can find little tiny bits of forgotten lives and honor and cherish those people by remembering them. And I feel like in those moments, I can truly understand the past, the present, and think about what the future will be. And those very personal and profound moments for me, I feel like I truly understand myself. Walt Whitman in Leaves of Grass, written 115 years ago, said some incredible words. When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were arranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts, the dots, to add, divide, and measure them, when I sitting heard the astronomer, where he spoke with much applause in the lecture room, how soon unaccountable I became tired and sick, till rising and gliding out, I wandered off in the mystical moist night air and from time to time looked up in perfect silence at the stars. You see, often when we are confronted with the most perfect solution, the most mathematically elegant proof, our minds still wander back to the unknown, searching for something, an answer, an experience which we can only find for ourselves. It's my great hope that each of us can stand in awe of something and experience such wonder and these tiny, beautiful, personal moments to be completely and utter, utterly helplessly awestruck by every beautiful thing that surrounds us. Thank you.